Welcome to Black Health Matters. I'm Daryl Armistead, your host. This episode is a Zoom recording of Howard University group session led by Dr. Clive Callender. It's on the reversal of diabetes, which we know that type 1 cannot be reversed, but type 2 can be prevented and reversed in many circumstances, particularly if you... Uh, adopt a healthy lifestyle that uh, Daryl has been talking about forever, uh, talking about uh, emphasizing uh, plant foods, uh, fruits and vegetables, exercising, uh, uh, because an ounce of is worth a pound of cure. And also if you uh, lose weight and do those things, then you can actually reverse type two diabetes. Type one is not reversible, but type two can be reversed. And so uh, that, that was a very interesting article that they talked much about uh, type one and type two diabetes. And uh, uh, most people aren't, aren't so aware that diabetes can be reversed if it's type two. Uh, they, uh, they know that it can't be reversed if it's type one. Type one means you don't have any insulin at all. Whereas type two means that you have insulin, but the insulin is uh, is is not effective in your body, uh, and so uh, for type one, the treatment of choice is uh, actually a pancreas transplant. Uh, for type two, the treatment of choice is healthy lifestyle, and uh, uh, healthy. I think for the most part, the uh, the two important ingredients for healthy lifestyle are. Uh, Reducing your your uh, meat in your diet and reducing the sugar in your diet; those are two of the most important parts of a healthy lifestyle, along with the exercise and other things that go along with it, which we'll talk about later in the program. But I thought then then there was another interesting article on uh, uh, being your own healthcare advocate. We talked about on a number of occasions. And of course, one of the best things is to have somebody go with you who you can rely on. They, they actually talk about hiring professional advocates and they say that it costs hundreds of dollars per hour. But if you have a friend or somebody who can rely on to go with you, that, that that's a lot cheaper and maybe more beneficial. Uh, they, they also talk in, in this, and, and I advise that people who take the post to look at the health section every Tuesday because they have an excellent health section that addresses many of the problems that uh, people of color have uh, uh, and uh, they emphasize that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But they also talk about the fact that uh, so, people, so few people, only less than 40% of the United States are exercising and uh, uh, that uh, you can reduce the likelihood of uh, uh, dementia as well as Parkinson's disease by exercising. Uh, and so those are some uh, interesting tidbits from the Washington Post health section that I wanted to share this morning. You ready now, John? Okay, well, we'll start off with, uh, with the excellent article that Carol has been uh, sent around to us, uh, which is uh, remarkable. The physical toll systemic injustice takes on the body, and we, we, we it's not a, a new uh, finding. It's just uh, uh, an actual objectification of what we all often suspected. None of us, however, were aware of the autopsy that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had when he was murdered. Uh, but uh, there's no question that he was assassinated. But one of the things that this article impresses is that, uh, is that uh, nobody knew he had the early onset of kidney disease. He looked physically fit, he was well-educated, and he, of course, he, he had a loving family and wife, and uh, we don't know about his his life lifestyle, but we do know that he was uh, uh, addressing institutionalized racism. And that chronic stress and exhaustion 
takes a toll. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that they found out, of course, which uh, demonstrated later on, is that uh, he's only 39. But uh, when they did his autopsy, they found that he had a, a heart of a 60 year old, uh, which uh, they attribute to uh, his tireless advocacy for racial injustice. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, so when they looked at his heart and found that it was like that, it uh, uh, gave uh, credence to what we've already known for decades and that uh, the impact of institutionalized racism uh, uh, makes you biologically older than you are. Uh, and uh, they talk about uh, uh, Eric Gamer, who was uh, uh, at 27, uh, died. Uh, uh, of course, her I issue was asthma, which is an another story. Uh, that's a different disease entity. Uh, and that's different from what happened with Martin Luther King. Of course, he didn't die of his, of his heart disease. He died of that bullet that, that took him. Keep going on down to, they go to the point about uh, his autopsy. Because I think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, speaks more loudly than anything else that you see in this article, that uh, all of us uh, deal with institutionalized racism and, uh, uh, and, and all of us deal with, with racism on a daily basis, whether we acknowledge it or not. Uh, the only thing is that uh, in this uh, situation, uh, we, we don't know how many how many diseases actually uh, are associated with racism? We know that hypertension is, we know that uh, 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 diabetes is, we know that there are many ways in which uh, institutionalized racism manifests itself. Uh, but I think that most of us were surprised that uh, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, What's actually demonstrated that he had the heart of a 60 year old. And it, this is something that uh, tells us that the, about the poll, that the, the toll that we pay for uh, being born black. And of course, it's uh, uh, that's when we have so many people who are black live to be old ages that we forget that they have survived in spite of racism, not, not because of racism. And uh, so, uh, so therefore, it's critically important that we adopt healthy lifestyles to try and overcome the ravages of institutionalized racism. And they talk about pro police brutality, and actually, in my opinion, that's a, that's one of the least uh, uh, likely forms of institutionalized racism, because uh, blacks are killing blacks more than whites are killing blacks. So that uh, we are often our own best, worst enemy, but a lot of that is is, is a consequence of the uh, racist uh, society that we live in. Uh, now, many uh, blacks have su survived and thrived, but that isn't because of racism. That may be in spite of in spite of racism, uh, and uh, so that you. Uh, I think the, the, the real moral of the story is that, yes, there's police brutality, but that's just one of the many side effects of institutionalized racism. Uh, and the, and, and, and that, that probably is a, a, a one-tenth of one percent of the uh, physical toll that institutionalized racism takes on us. It's just that that is more obvious because there are police who are killing Black people. But... Uh, more black people are killing black people than they're killing black people. And so uh, we, uh, more than any other group, uh, really need to uh, understand that uh, physical exercise, spirituality, meditation, uh, uh, adopting a healthy lifestyle is op maybe optional for some people, but it's, it's pretty mandatory for us because of the the uh, uh, the many issues that uh, racism 
uh, plays in our space. You know, we talk about the redlining from the political perspective and uh, the way in which we've been brought up in schools with the history that eliminates us from from uh, from, from our own knowledge of our own uh, importance to America and as well as the other things so that uh, uh, it's important for us to understand that yes, this is a critical issue and our health is a demonstration of the fact that there's a majority minority health disparity uh, and also the the ravages of uh, COVID demonstrate to us uh, uh, the, the price we pay for the institutionalized racism that afflicts and affects us. Uh, any other comments that you want to make about this article that uh, is alarming in many ways? But I, I guess the most alarming part of it is that in spite of uh, Martin Luther King being uh, assassinated, he was uh, actually being killed by the institutionalized racism that he was he was fighting against. Uh, I got a comment. Okay, we talk about we talk about healthy lifestyles, which includes a good diet and exercise. But there's one thing that uh, we don't very often talk about. Uh, and okay, I hate to I hate to really say it because it sounds so simple, but. Um, a smile is an antidote to stress. You can't feel <laughs> stress when you're smiling. Now, as a if you look at if you look at the group, uh, this group session, you look at our pictures. Uh, I've been looking at it um, all the time, and right now, uh, the only person smiling is Dr. Callender and me. Uh, it doesn't have to be a grin. As a people, we laugh very easily, but we don't smile. You know, as far as like uh, a smile being on your face all the time, that's not us. Uh, but that's because we're reacting to stress. But I guarantee that, okay, it's, uh, here's, a, here's what a smile is, really is. A smile is not a grin. You can feel a smile from your eyes. When your eyes are relaxed and they're gentle, that's a smile. And when that, when that happens, there's no way that you can feel stress. Uh, it's a practice. If you practice smiling all the time, uh, your smile will be your umbrella and it'll be your antidote. But it has that's a lifestyle. That's a healthy lifestyle. So uh, take that with you. I like that. Very, very interesting comment. Uh, uh, it's interesting. I was looking at pictures as well. Uh, and not, not of uh, us, but uh, pictures of people uh, who are professionals and uh, it's not common that people smile. Uh, and you may ask, why do I smile so much? It's actually a, a, a very simple reason. It isn't necessarily because I'm happy, which I am, but it's it's because one day somebody said, you look so much better when you smile. <laughs> so that's a, that's a Kirk Franklin lyric. He's got a song called Smile, and the lyrics say, you look so much better when you smile. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so it, it's interesting that it is therapeutic, and it's a, another great point that you've made. That uh, Any other comments on uh, on how we, how we, for example, uh, uh, John Buchanan talked about yoga. Of course, that's another way of uh, addressing institutionalized racism. Uh, so that's one of the many ways, uh, uh, I, although I think that smiling is a, a fascinating idea and, and a way all of us can do it easily, uh, but uh, it takes uh, concentration and really commitment. Uh, any other thoughts? Yeah, I'd, like to hear, I'd like to hear how Dr. Apto deals with uh, institutionalized racism. Institutionalized uh, racism. Um, <laughs> how do I view? You know, um, how do I view it? Um, you know, <laughs> it is it's a very uh, where I grew up in Nigeria. We don't have, you know, racism. <laughs> You know, we don't have, we have uh, ethnic uh, rivalries. 
um, we don't have uh, that black and white stuff like they have in America here. No, sure you do. I went to Nigeria. I went to Nigeria, and uh -huh. they treated the white people differently than they treated the black people. They so treat I, I don't agree that in Nigeria you don't have racism. You do have it, but it's just different, expressed differently. Also, when I went to the beach, on the beaches, uh, the uh, black people were putting on whitening cream, and the white people were putting on blackening cream. So, uh, so I disagree in terms of uh, of, of uh, Nigeria because I spent time in Nigeria and. Uh, I, I felt uh, racism was evident there. Well, when you think about it, who was running Nigeria for uh, 50 years? White people. And they were teaching you their own racist practices in their own fashion. I'm not sure that you were actually aware of it, but it was there. Well, you know, the reason why I asked Dr. Atto that question was because he told us that when he was younger, they used to worship the white man but then when he got yes. over to America, he said <laughs> he wants to slap one every time he sees one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, what, what we have there is more of uh, ethnic uh, uh, rivalries than race, you know, black and white. Right. Um, the population of white people in uh, my country is so insignificant, you know, um, uh, that they they do not um, you know nowadays we don't uh, we don't regard them as anything. The the main the major uh, contending groups are the uh, indigenous themselves. You know the ethnic rivalries between the Igbos, the Yorubas, the Hausas. You know you can see the the election this recent election now. Um, it was more of an ethnic election. The Igbos wanted to be to be the president. The Northerners wanted another person to be the president. Atiku Abubakar, the Yorubas wanted uh, Tinibu to be the president. So it's more of ethnic rivalry. It's not about race. People who bleach their their skins in in my country in Nigeria, you know the blacks who bleach. They are trying, you know, trying to imitate to change their skin color. Um, they are very minor, very, very, very minor. They are not that many. But what we have there mostly is a ethnic division, a tribal division, which is killing that country. Very true. Uh, that that is what is killing the country. That is correct. But uh, any other comments about? Uh... Uh, this article and uh, how how you in your own fashion uh, address the institutionalized racism which is so pervasive. Uh, yeah, I, I got a comment, and that comment would be, um, you know, traditionally African Americans have uh, tried to counter racism with love, uh, loving all people. You know, just say that um, the love of Christ transcends all problems and you apply you apply that to the problem you love all people uh realistically uh in america you can love the white man all you want but they're not going to love you back uh, as a matter <laughs> of fact it's so institutional that they're going to continue to hate you and so uh the way i deal with it is uh this is one of the four toltec agreements of life and uh one of their agreements is to don't take anything personally because the the uh, the dirt that people do you is always coming from ignorance and um it's like they do it but uh <laughs> when it's coming by when it's coming from ignorance um it's not it's not on purpose it's just that society kind of makes them do it and that's a that's an ignorant thing but uh, when you don't take the, the when you don't take the uh, the deeds of your fellow man personally, that that helps you rise above. It, it helps you uh, ascend the, the situation. <laughs> well, that felt like a dad. Um, I was thinking. Um...
two thoughts. Um, how do Do you not internalize it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, young people do it. And it was an age. Uh, and black people do it too. Uh, we got to look hard. You you frown. You can't let somebody know you're soft. And if you smile, you have a little cliche. <laughs> we say, oh, I'm going to give you that white lady smile. You know, they see you and they smile. <laughs> and so you know he tried to tell but even in singing we tell them to lift that jaw you you gotta just take the thoughts they're doing this out of pure ignorance but you still feel like hitting them Or something, and I don't occur. So, with Q tip, oh, uh, yeah, we had a workshop in an education, and teenagers especially do things that are just stupid and they say things against you, even you know, they're growing up and all these hormones. And so, uh, one of the lecturers told us to do Q tip, and um, we said, Well, what is that? Quit taking it personally, they're not really doing it against you they're doing because of their reaction to society and just growing up you know kids do stupid stuff and they'll say stupid stuff to you and stuff especially teenagers and they said just apply that theory quit taking it personally and you do that with a lot of adults and everybody just don't you know like they're attacking me and I'm going to attack them back just stop taking it personally and I try to do that a lot but sometimes I take it personally and then I have to realize i have taken this personally. So I should, you apply that concept. It's easier said than done. I have a, have a comment also, uh, what Carol just said about, you know, looking mean. Uh, when, when I was growing up, you know, that's kind of like the way I thought I had to be, you know, you had to have a frown on your face, you had to look mean to, to keep the bullies uh, <laughs> away, you know, and, uh, and what Dr. Callender said about <laughs> yoga is also true. You know, when you're when you're exercising or when you're doing yoga, sometimes you have a tendency to to frown up when you're trying to do a move. You know, trying to uh, you know, and the the instructor says, "All right, smile." You know, and you do <laughs> feel better when when you smile, but a lot of times you don't even notice that you're frowning. And the last thing, you know, if if you're walking down the street and you see somebody walking down the street smiling, I used to think that that person was crazy. <laughs> they, they were mentally ill, you know, around smiling and everything. But uh, I, I agree with, with Daryl that that is um, something that can affect your, your, your spirit and your soul. Yes. Uh, when I run, uh, I... Okay, when I run, uh, when I run past anybody uh, driving a car or on the street, I smile and wave. And, uh, <laughs> they so know you're crazy, man. <laughs> it, it does a couple of things. Um, everybody in the neighborhood uh, from blocks around, they know me because I'm the black guy who smiles and waves. And so... <laughs> Uh, when I see people in the grocery store, uh, they say, hey, I know you. You're the runner that runs down this street or that street. And uh, like when I say, let a smile be your umbrella, it makes a difference. Uh, before I started running, smiling when I ran and waving at everybody, uh, I was much more likely for drivers to try to run me off the road. I've had to, I've had to ditch. Uh, and it's always white folks. They're looking dead at me. It's no mistake. They're trying to <laughs> run me off the road. Uh -huh. And I've had to ditch uh, at least three times that I can remember when people try to hit me with their cars. And um, I've had to ditch far less uh, once I smile and run. So it really is my umbrella. <laughs> hmm. any, any other comments? Um, we just go one. Next? Um, somebody's getting ready to beat you up and you smile at them, you're going to be dead. 
You may or may not be. Right. They might think you're crazy and stuff. <laughs> I was going to yeah. tell Daryl to stop, stop running and try yoga. Uh, what? Uh, any other comments? I'm. I am a yoga I practitioner. I, I I did study yoga, and uh, I maintain a lot of uh, yoga elements in my current lifestyle. Joyce. Yes, I I can identify with what Darren was saying with his running. Um, as you know, we have my mother-in-law's little dog here, and we go out for a walk every day. And when cars by passes by pass by, I raise my hand and I give a smile. So I'm known in the, in the mm -hmm. neighborhood as the lady with the little brown dog. And, and you can <laughs> tell now I see where people give us a little bit more space when we're out walking. So it it, it does make a difference. <laughs> Any final comments? I think this has been a good uh, session. And thanks, Carol, for this article that helps us to, to think positively about how we can uh, uh, keep healthy in spite of and the obstacles that we face. Uh, um, Dr. Um, Calder, remember some time ago you had an article about our people and our children when they had trauma and they grow up with various diseases and et cetera, and how we don't think that this actually affects our children and why Blacks um, have more diseases. So we think about even in DC, our children are in Maryland, that are experiencing the trauma of seeing loved ones being killed and et cetera. And we give them a little bit of therapy and they're supposed to, maybe if they get the therapy, because like what my daughter was teaching at Baloo and children at the bus stop seeing someone killed, nothing was done for those children experiencing that trauma in front of them. And some of them came to school with the blood splattered on them and we see nothing being done. And then we're wondering what's happening to these young adults when they go all for experiencing all this sickness and illness and even mental illness. It starts very young, but I don't know what the solution is to get our people to help the therapy that they actually need. Well spoken, Whitney. That is so well, so true. Elizabeth? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sort of <laughs> going between a women's retreat and, and I says, well, you know, I got to get on here because I it's so much good stuff that we share. So um, again, good morning, everyone. Um, quickly uh, talk about racism. Um, I lived in Southern states. I was reared in Southern states. Uh, deep South. I went to school in Deep South. And and my mother and father was very, very protective. We didn't go anywhere without them, whether it was my mother <laughs> or my father. Okay? <laughs> but my father um, purchased land and, you know, during that time, um, and I can only speak about that area, and during that time, you could buy land, and but they wouldn't build your house. <laughs> and so, where you know, and compared to the the other uh, races, you know, they built them um, su um, housing complex, suburbs, and all that kind of stuff, right? But when it comes to when it came to us, uh, even after my father bought the land. Um, they weren't building my house. And so he decided him and his brother would build us a house because that's what my mother wanted. And mm -hmm. so he went to the lumber mill to start purchasing the land, I mean the house. And there was a young man that had grown up to be about 18 or 20 and he was in the contracting business. And he asked my father and my father had such a all the things you guys have said about the smiles and the greetings and that he had just had a way about living in that era where they just didn't bother him, okay? Uh, he just had a way of dealing with people and we picked it up. And so this young man saw him and he said, um, Mr. Ghost, Mr. Paul, uh, 
you trying to build a house? He says, yes. He said, I guess it's going to have to be my brother and I. He said, oh, no, I will build your house. And I will be your house because every time you came in, it wasn't Home Depot, but it was the lumber mill, you know? He said, every time you came here, you were the only black man that always spoke to me. <laughs> hmm. And so, you know, that goes back to the smile and the kindness, okay? How it comes back around. But my father and mother protected us. And when I turned 18, I began to see what they had protected us from. <laughs> it was it was hell. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. It was hell. And I think, you know, and I'm now in my 70s. And I thank God that my father and mother taught me those techniques. Because my grandfather taught my father. Because when I went to our university, my mother told me, I asked, how do I survive with this family, this Caucasian family, that I'm going to stay with this summer? Hmm. And my mother gave me a tip. And I use that tip. And I'm now still a part of that family. And so racism is, is horrible. And in, it, in the deep south, it is really horrible. And people endure it and smile. <laughs> and, and they hold fast to the Lord's hand because that's the only thing going to get them out of the situation. You know, and I, and I went to school in the top part of the state and I would go home with some of the kids and what we had um, down in the New Orleans area and the Gulf Coast area some of them did not have wood floors which was shocking to me okay compared to where I came from so it 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 affects you inner but you you just got to you got to do like Dara said. You got to keep that smile and that waving and that friendly, you know, those personas, those personalities, you know, because, and I'm going to cut this off right now, because when I worked in Tennessee and, and I worked a lot of places where I was the only one, okay? And I was just telling my granddaughter about the different personalities I had to have, you know, just to work on that job, you know? I was very well liked by my boss and his boss and all the corporations because I was like an auditor, okay? And so um, I did a lot of corporation books. I saw a lot of crooked stuff done to black people in that <laughs> thing. But I had to smile, be friendly, be the top, as they said, be at the top of the class and be willing to help everybody in a friendly tone but knew how to pull back in a gentle way. Because if you if you did it without the smiles, without the personality, then you were considered hostile. And then they will fire you. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> you 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 have to learn and you have to, you have to be a quick learner. And and everything everybody has said, I totally agree. But living and growing up in the deep south and then coming here. <laughs> In the D South, they took off their mask. They let you know who they were. But coming <laughs> up here, they put on the mask. But see, I could still see them because I was familiar with those without the mask. That's I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you very much for your timely comments. Any others before we move to the next subject? Just just one quick comment. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I don't know how to put my hand up on the screen, so that's why. <laughs> but anyway. Um, this was just talked about the Deep South. Well, I was born in Washington, D.C., but we moved to Beaufort, South Carolina. That's down in Delhi <laughs> when I was four years old. So I don't really remember those first three years of my life here in D.C. But I just want to say that the very first friend I ever had that I remember was a little white boy who lived across the street from us in Beaufort, South Carolina. And consequently, I, race is just not that prevalent in my mind. I just, I just see people as people. And 
you know, I realized the difference. I realized that, you know, we are treated different. I realized I've worked in jobs, like Elizabeth just said, where you see that the whites do better than the blacks and they do this, that, and the other. But my, my mindset is that we are all God's people. And I, I go from there. <laughs> thank you for that comment. Any final comments? Uh, thank you very much. It's been an interesting session. To hear. I think um, if I could say one thing, what yes. uh, Daryl said is true. Uh, you respond to that smile. Uh, he said uh, today and looking at everyone's face, not everyone is smiling. I have a reason why I wasn't smiling. I'm kind of nervous today. Uh, I think Joyce knows my story. I was trying for two years to move forward, downside. You all know my husband passed. Joyce, I'm buying a house. I'll go to settlement next week. <laughs> and, um, it's been uh, trials and tribulations, but also getting back to the smile. Um, Daryl, you're right. When you walk the streets, walk and jogging, you see a neighbor, say hi. Uh, before you got to the end of your story, I felt that in your case, you might have been in a predominantly white neighborhood because sometimes when you're walking and jogging and you're, hey, they gonna look at you. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> they take that smile in a different tone. But with most black people, they are more aggressively to be responsive and respond with a smile. Um, smiling, not smiling, look at my son, Chris. Now, Chris will smile the drunk man on the street or the president of the United States, and he's going <laughs> to uh, In my neighborhood, everybody knows Chris because he's going to make himself known. Uh, Dr. Callender, you'll be pleased to know he has was back and forth after his dad, and, you know, what am I going to do, and, you know, stressful. He's got his place. He's happy. Um, everybody in the neighborhood knows him, and he's been there one month. He has that smile. <laughs> so it's um, very important sometimes to bring that happiness out as opposed to holding it in. But I'm saying this to say all of you all support me during this trial and tribulation that I'm going through now because I need your support. But smiling makes a difference. And sometimes they don't have to smile back. You feel good that you smile. And I'm going to take one more step, Dr. Callender, in my walks uh, the past few weeks. I saw a friend of yours. Dr. Victor Scott. Now, you know, that goes way back. Yes, yes. Yes, he was walking. Yeah. So anyway, everybody keeps smiling. Okay, thank you very much for all of the comments. Yeah. And uh, let's move to the next article now. Oh, well, this is, uh, I, I was hoping you'd keep that for last, but this is just an article that talks about 10 tips for healthier lifestyle. And it talks first about uh, our skin and about the fact that wrinkles and other skin lines make you look older than you are. And that uh, one of the first things you need to do is to uh, use sunscreen, especially the summer's coming up. And we uh, uh, tan and burn just like anybody else. And so the use of skin moistures and mm -hmm. moistures and as well as sunscreen is very important. Exercise, of course, we talked about ad nauseum, uh, but uh, sometimes we don't realize that not only is exercise, but weightlifting along that together will reduce the loss of muscle mass and help strengthen your bones and uh, reduce the risk of falling, which is what uh, uh, is the, the way in which many seniors die because if they fall and have accidents. Eating wisely, of course, is... Uh, one of the best advices you can give. Uh, the question is, uh, will they follow it? Will you uh, spend most of your time eating fruits and vegetables and minimize sugar and processed foods? Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's little question that a plant-based diet is the healthiest diet. Substance abuse is a major no. Stop smoking and drink very little alcohol if possible, none preferably, because some people can't drink one drink of alcohol uh, if they're alcoholic. So uh, staying away from it may well be good for some. Although there's a, a many uh, health advocates who identify one drink of alcohol as being good for you. 
a one drink for uh, women and two drinks for men. Uh, getting proper screening is something that uh, I, I recognize is not really done as it should be. And we talk about the mammograms and pap smears for women every other year until you get to 65, uh, but and then even after. But uh, uh, that's not all the sense. Uh, colonoscopies every five to 10 years after the age of 40. Blood tests for cholesterol levels, blood sugar, a complete gut count and a kidney profile. Uh, what what uh, uh, people tend not to talk about is is actually taking your blood pressure at home and uh, keeping your blood pressure at 130 over 80 or lower. Uh, measuring your blood pressure at home uh, is a very necessary health tip. Uh, doing that once or twice a week is desirable. Uh, uh, something that isn't recognized is when you get over 50, especially if you're black, the likelihood of kidney disease is, is very high. And so uh, if you're not getting your urine tested for protein, you should. Everybody over 50 should get their urine tested for protein because protein in the urine is the earliest sign of kidney disease and early detection is important. Along with that, for black men particularly, a prostate exam and a PSA blood test are advised yearly. This is not as often required in the white population, but in the black population, I think it's important. Uh, don't ignore chronic conditions, uh, taking your vaccines, COVID, flu, pneumonia, and herpes zoster. Vaccines are important. Uh, and so, uh, and then having a positive attitude and going back to some of the things that were said today by, by many. Uh, uh, having a healthy lifestyle and a positive perspective, those together are very important. Uh, I uh, emphasize meditation uh, because I think that uh, we talk a lot about physical health, but we talk less about uh, spiritual health and spiritual, mental and physical health together uh, give you good health. Uh, uh, now, uh, whenever you take supplicants and medications, when you see your doctor, that has to be uh, shared with the doctor uh, so that he knows exactly what you're taking, whether it's over the counter or under the counter or whatever. Uh, and finally, your genetic profile is important, uh, but adhering to a healthy lifestyle is even more important because it may overcome your negative ge genetic profile if you adopt a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diet. So those are just some healthy tips that I think are important. There's some things that are particularly important, important to our people of color who have more hypertension, more diabetes and uh, a more obesity. And as such, uh, I think it's important to uh, think about these healthy life tips. Any comments or questions or additions to what we yeah, I got a comment. Tina Turner died uh, within the last week and she had a famously healthy lifestyle she was uh, a vegan. Uh, she exercised. She was a Buddhist meditationalist. Uh, but she ignored her hypertension, which killed her kidneys, and that led to her death. So you got to cover all the bases. It was just proper that uh, you mentioned that because you're right. She did. Uh, I didn't realize she was a vegan, but. Uh, uh, and she, sub she was subject to a lot of abuse from her husband as well. And uh, so but she, she died wealthy, <laughs> interestingly enough, because she was so popular and uh, her dancing and singing uh, really helped a lot. Uh, but uh, she actually had a kidney transplant and a, and a stroke. Uh, hypertension is a sound killer and it uh, uh, really killed her as well, so. And as and then Daryl's point is well taken. Any other comments about uh, her or any of the things we've talked about? Another another person who had a kidney successful kidney transplant.
Okay, let's go to the next one, unless you have comments about it. I had a, I had a quick question. Her her husband was her donor, her kidney donor. Mm -hmm. I thought that was, that was very interesting. Is how how rare is that? That's not rare, but uh, having a, a donor as a husband who's abusing you is uh, less common. But uh, it's it's, it's it, it, we're doing it more more than we used to having uh, husbands who volunteer to help their spouses. If they just have to be the right blood type and the right tissue type. That was her second husband, though, right? That gave right. her the kidney. Not, so not it wasn't husband. the husband who was abusing her? No, no, no. It was not I. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. That is an article that is very important for us because many of us are over 50. And uh, one of the commonest causes of death for us is uh, falling and fracturing bones, especially the hip. And uh, so it's important, therefore, that uh, we get tests to make sure that uh, bones are strong enough. And if not, uh, to take the medical medications that will help us and the exercise aspects that will help us strengthen our muscles and uh, our bones. Osteoporosis is a problem and uh, uh, many people really take vitamin D and calcium as a consequence of the uh, uh, complication of osteoporosis and the fact that it leads to fractures, which leads to uh, death in many instances. So it's uh, important for us to be aware uh, and have a, a, a special bone scan to find out if we actually have osteoporosis so it can be treated appropriately. Osteoporosis is just a softening of the bone, which then leads, if you fall, to fractures, which means the bone is broken, uh, and which then requires surgery. Uh, which uh, is a problem. And of course, the oral biphosphonates uh, are medications that they give to try to overcome the osteoporosis along with vitamin D and calcium. And this points out that uh, a fracture is akin to a heart attack and has a very similar one-year mortality rate for people who are over 50. And so they should be avoided at all costs. Uh, John has, Tatum has been very fortunate. He's had a number of, of fractures, but hasn't been able to overcome them. Calling a bone attack like a heart attack uh, uh, kind of helps us recognize that avoiding uh, fractures by exercise, muscle, and, and other aerobic exercises it becomes important. Any uh, additional comments about osteoporosis or bone fractures? Um, I agree with all of that. And there's a lot of workshops that go on for senior citizens. But I've always had this question, you know, even from childhood, children, everyone falls, you know, just walking along. But there's one thing that I've never seen the answer to. What happens when, you know, like your legs give out or a leg or a knee gives out and you're doing all the precautions, the rugs and hand bars, but you're just standing there and all of a sudden it gives out. There is nothing, is there anything preventable to help you when your leg goes out or legs go out? The only thing that helps is if your muscles are stronger, but uh, that's, you're right, that's that's one of the things that uh, is more difficult to uh, prevent uh, because that does happen, of course. And, uh, uh, but theoretically, if your muscles are strong, you're more likely to survive the fall without 
breaking your bones than if you did not do the exercise. Dr. Counter, what, what causes that? Um, you know, sometimes when I, I uh, step up the stair with my left foot, my my knee seems weak and it, it No, but it's very common as you age. Uh, uh, I don't know a way of preventing it. I just know that the best protection for that is the uh, muscle exercises and, and weightlifting that you do. Uh, but I don't know any special treatment that prevents uh, that from happening to anyone, because that's what you're asking. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, now, this is an article that talks about uh, the way in which healthcare professionals speak to patients and the fact that a careful choice of words is important. Uh, my wife talks about a, a, her aunt who uh, was very sick and uh, had a pulmonary uh, condition. And, uh, and uh, so the she asked the doctor, well, what does that mean? And the doctor said, uh, it means you're going to die and walk out of the room. Uh, so it's it's important that not only do you know uh, your medicine, but you, has, you also have to know how to talk to pe people. Uh, as uh, uh, has been said, uh, people don't necessarily remember everything you say, but they remember how you make them feel. And uh, so it becomes important to use terms that people can understand and also be to be sympathetic and empathetic when you talk to people, whether they have terminal diseases or uh, chronic diseases. And so the perception of what the word means to them becomes as important as the word itself. Uh, so, uh, Telling a person they have schizophrenia is not the same as indicating that you have a, a, a disease in which your your uh, ability to uh, uh, differentiate between what is real and what is unreal is, uh, is maybe a better way of saying it because what is important is not only the, 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 the diagnosis, but the way in which you communicate uh, whether you call it a personality disorder or whatever you call it, uh, giving a name to it, sometimes is not the best thing you can do as a physician. And so uh, it is important that we as healthcare professionals learn how to communicate effectively with our patients without labeling them with terms that are harmful and destructive to them. And uh, that that's the essence of what this is all about, uh, is that in the past, Sometimes healthcare professionals have been dismissive in their terms without uh, understanding the possible harm that comes from them. You know, when you tell a patient that they have end-stage renal disease, uh, that, that actually closes off the person's mind for the rest of the conversation, unless you try to uh, deal with them emotionally and help them understand that there's hope. Uh, and so with everything that you do and you give the people hope, I think that's an important uh, term to use uh, when you're telling people that they have a disease entity, no matter what it is. So just giving them the diagnosis is not enough. Uh, live with their chronic condition or, or terminal condition, uh, how to uh, make it uh, to the uh, the last days or the whatever number of days they have left becomes more important than the the diagnosis that you've made and shared with them. Any comments about that? Because I think that uh, this is something that is perhaps more important to healthcare professionals as they deal with patients than it is to the patients themselves, because often the patients sometimes are treated in a fashion that is dismissive rather than uh, helpful. Any comments or thoughts about the, uh, the fact? Because medical terms are not 
necessarily the best terms that can be used to, to communicate actually what's going on with the patient. I remember that Tatum talked about the fact that the doctor labeled him as having uh, arteriosclerosis without actually explaining to him what he was talking about or letting him know. And, and sometimes we use diagnoses instead of explaining to patients exactly what's going on. And that's something that uh, we need to do better about. So I thought I'd to point out how we, we as healthcare professionals can do better. Uh, yes, you can tell somebody the diagnosis, but that's just one aspect of it. The rest of it is uh, telling them how they can deal with it and how they can be hopeful and positive about dealing with whatever condition they have. Dr. Callender, uh, speaking of terms, uh, what is the difference between osteoporosis and osteopenia? Osteopenia causes osteoporosis. Osteopenia means that the, the calcium in the bones is decreased. Osteoporosis uh, occurs as a consequence of osteopenia. So osteopenia leads to osteoporosis. Hello. Hello, Thank everyone. you for that. Um, hello, everyone. I have a Hi, good comment. to see you again. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, the comment is I remember when my mom was this, and we were in a hospital, and I was talking to, I used to couldn't say the word dialysis. Now she has a transplant uh, mail, but I used to couldn't say the word dialysis without crying. But when we didn't know anything, and before I changed my thought process, and one of the people here said, dialysis is a good thing because it's keeping your mom alive. Now, when I hear the word, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's something that can that's very helpful for people. But that being said, when I didn't know anything about it, and we talked to the doctor in the hospital, he was like, well, it doesn't really make a difference because she's not going to live that, you know, you can't live that long with dialysis anyway. <laughs> I'm like... What, wow. And I just won't ever forget that day. Um, I thought it was the most inconsiderate, rude statement that somebody can ever say to somebody who's brand new and learning more about what dialysis is and what it means. And of course, talking to a parent, you know, who you want to be around forever. forever. Um, and then the other part is, you was talking about osteoporosis. Hopefully I'm saying that right. So I, I want I would like to know my bones are cracking. <laughs> They're cracking more than ever. So I guess with normal cracking for bones or not, like my elbow I have to like crack every day or my knees crack. Is that like bad? Well, I think uh, the, the real answer to that is demonstrated by uh, getting x-rays to look at your bones to see that they're okay. <laughs> if they are okay and there's uh, for example, the scan that they, the, the DEXA scan that they talk about identifies whether or not the bones are deficient in calcium or not. And if the bone studies show that uh, your bones are okay, then that would mean that the cracking is insignificant. Oh, uh, okay. So, so uh, 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 X-ray or DEXA scan would identify whether or not the bones have enough calcium in them. And if they do, then the cracking might be insignificant. Okay. But I, I, I'm glad you pointed out uh, the, the use of the term dialysis as a standalone may be harmful if you don't explain exactly what it's all about. And the fact that people who are on uh, the artificial kidney treatments uh, live for years uh, and, and some thrive and survive well uh, with the artificial kidney treatments. And there's a and we call them euphemism, but there's terms that can be used that are less painful as 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 the term dialysis, especially if you can uh, express to them the hopefulness aspect of the treatment. So thank you for your comment. It's good to see you again. Okay. Um, Dr. Cameron, I, I know we shouldn't use it, but sometimes, you know, doctors use terminologies. Well, I think all professionals, educational, they'll use their jargon and expect you to understand it. And then if you 
ask them, what does that mean? You feel like somewhat a dope. And, you know, because they expect you to know all the lingo and et cetera. So what I do sometimes, I'll write it down and then Google it. And Google has a nice way of telling you what it is. Sometimes it can alarm you, but sometimes, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't Google it, but uh, I'm trying to understand what they're saying. Well, I don't think anything wrong with Googling it, but I think uh, our healthcare professionals should be more positive and helpful and, and actually uh, after they give you the diagnosis to really tell you what it means in common language. Uh, and I think that's something that we uh, we error. I mean, that's an error we make. And we're so used to using those terms, we don't realize that in, for some it's offensive uh, because it doesn't clarify or articulate uh, how you can uh, uh, thr survive and thrive with whatever disease entity. And some people say one of the ways to live a long life is to have a chronic disease and spend the rest of your life taking care of it. So that uh, having a disease isn't necessarily harmful, especially if you know how to uh, live in, in spite of it. But I think our doctors need more sessions to learn more about the, the negative impact of the jargon that we use. You know, they have books, you know, like um, computers for dummies and stuff like that. I was just wondering, they had medicine for dummies. You, you see those books <laughs> to, to help people like that well, understand I, I think, it. Well, I think we need to do a better job of that. That's an area in which we are we commonly make many mistakes. And so uh, that's we need to have more attention to the fact that uh, our jargon is not necessarily the patient's vocabulary. Well, that's not the only field. If you, women, especially, we go to um, mechanics. And, you know, something's wrong with your car. And they tell you do all this stuff. And I don't have a clue what they're saying. <laughs> Looking at you. And I got to go home and ask John or somebody, who in the world are they talking about what's wrong with my car? You know, but, um, you know, you don't want them to break it down because a lot of times they could be jipping you or something like that or telling you something's wrong that's really not wrong. But they're using this terminology so uh, um, you think that they're more than what they are, but that's just uh, something. Well, uh, for healthcare, we need to be helpful to the patients and help them to understand what they have, but also how they can overcome uh, the consequences of whatever disease entity they have. So we got to do better. Hey, Carol, <laughs> men get gypped at the car dealer too, so it's not just women. Uh, they get, uh, but, but but they get more gypped more than men. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is an article that talks about uh, a health concern that is becoming more and more important, particularly in the black community. It used to be that uh, whites uh, committed suicide much more than people of color, but uh, uh, of course, North Carolina State is not, is a predominantly white institution, but they had 14 student deaths, two overdoses and four natural deaths and one car accidents. And so when you have young people who die, then that of course is, uh, real concern and then when you have two two suicides in addition that is a health crisis and so <clears throat> this then brings to, to attention something we've noticed since the pandemic that mental health concerns are increasing and suicide uh, is becoming more and more an issue particularly in teenagers and people of color uh, you mentioned, Carol mentioned the fact that uh, in many circumstances, our young people are associated with uh, traumatic experiences and they don't get the mental health concerns that they need. Uh, this is very important because as she mentioned and later on in life, they have some of the same disease entities that uh, racism produces. Uh, hypertension, arteriosclerosis, diabetes, and so forth, and obesity. And so uh, if they have the uh, mental health 
uh, issues addressed uh, and have the psychotherapy that is necessary, this can prevent disease later on in life. So, so uh, it's important uh, when they have these traumatic experiences that they get the mental health care that they need to have. And, and we need to do whatever we can to help provide that. Any more comments about the, the, the crisis, mental health crisis that we have? Not only, uh, and not only is it uh, an issue for uh, our young people, but it's an issue for our teenagers and uh, young adults as well. And the new suicide hotline 988 has been uh, uh, coming to place so that you know, the people who are considering suicide will call and get help because that is so important. I, I just entered a chat about a racist slur that we inadvertently just used. The Jim statement. Yeah. It's amazing how uh, these words uh, come into play and we sometimes take them for granted without realizing that they are sl sl racial slurs. Yeah, I, I had one of my students, I might have shared this with the group uh, before, uh, I was teaching in junior high school and one of my graduates had come back. He was uh, graduated from high school already, he had a girlfriend that, that quit him and she was pregnant with with his child. And uh, he he came back to the school. We had band rehearsal. He he stayed after band rehearsal and talked to me, you know, about it. He was he was hurting, you know, pretty bad. And uh, two days later, he committed suicide. Really? Yes. And wow, you know, it's, it's the type of thing you you really don't know. One one of the points in this article was that. They, they want to require that every student get exposed at least to uh, some training uh, or some awareness at least about how they're how they're feeling and and their you know uh, I guess their 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 affect I'm not sure if that's the right term but it is you know what, it is how, how, how they're how they're dealing with with the with the stress because there's a lot of stress in life that you know that we take on with without help a lot of them don't have the the spiritual background that many of us have and you know that's why a lot of them turn to to substances and uh, uh other behavior you know to to deal with that and the social media is not something that has been helpful many ways the social media uh, reinforces the isolation, uh, which is uh, damaging. And this, like, this is Mental Health Awareness Month as well. That's correct. Yeah. Like Carol said with um, her Q-tip suggestion, quit taking it personal. When your baby mama dumps you, don't take it personal. Just keep on stepping. <laughs> Easier said than done. Um, Easier said than done. <laughs> One thing that we can do, um, children do have stress and they express it and adults seem to look at children and say, what are you stressed about? But think of our system in elementary school, there's no longer recess. There is the stress and Japan and China experienced the high rates of suicide because they stopped giving their children breaks to play. They said they got to learn their below level in reading and math and that they got to have that all the time. They put the stress on the teachers. But let children be children. I know my grandchildren are ecstatic. They said one school, let them in middle school have recess. And, you know, even my own children, when they were growing up, they would rather choose gym than some academics. But they need that release. When you have children around, give them that release. The reason media is so harmful for our children because they're sitting down looking at a gadget instead of going outside and play. And sometimes I'll say, go outside and play. And they look at you quizzically, what? And we're saying it's so harmful outside for them, but they need that release time, just a time to do nothing. 
even when we have children outside, we think they need an organized play se session. They got to be in an organized group in order to play. Children have no time to just relax and be it. And then it grows up into an adult. We do not have that relaxing time, whether for meditation or something, just something to relax and to relax your mind. And we need that physical exercise. Children need it. They come home, they're latchkey kids. They got to stand there, sit there and do another four or five hours of homework. There are some societies like in Columbia, Maryland, they do not believe in giving children homework mm -hmm. in elementary school. Come home and play, do your chores and go to school without that stress of schoolwork. And we as parents and grandparents, we put too much emphasis on the homework and not enough time. So when you get a chance and you see children, take away their stuff, tell them to go play. At first, when they go outside, they just standing around like zombies because they don't know how to have that free form of play. But teach them, you know, go. I know sticks are not allowed or stones, but they'll find something outside or just sit out there and think. But I think this generation needs to have that time. And so adults take time for relaxation, meditation, but they need that physical Any exercise. Any other comments? I have uh, um, two teenage, well, we have, my husband and I, we have two teenage boys, one 18, who just, um, I, but with him, I'm trying to learn how to listen to hear him instead of listening to respond to him. Um, because there are times we're like, well, mom, I don't know what I want to do. Or, you know, I felt pressure when I graduated from high school. I didn't know if I wanted to do an EMT. He's going to school for computer technology, but he's also writing a book. So if you guys know any authors, let me know so I can let him talk to an author. Um, but I'm trying to encourage that with him as well. But at some point, um, he said he was feeling sad. This was like a year and a half ago or so. And I said, and I asked him, or are you sad all the time? Or is this a, a moment in time? But regardless, I got him a counselor to help him through that because I figured maybe it's things that he doesn't feel comfortable with speaking with me or his dad about. But I also wanted to lay that foundation to both of the boys. It's okay to talk to somebody. You may not necessarily be able to talk to your mom or your dad, but if you need to get outside, help, help is available. Um, so that's what I have to say. And then my worst fear is what you guys talked about a few minutes ago is the suicide and being in school and putting that much pressure. Because as he was speaking, oh, I'm too much pressure. I want to say, suck it up. My first instinct was like, suck it up. Life is hard, son. But um, I had to try to hear what he was. He wanted to say. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Any other comments? Yes, uh, this is Elizabeth. Uh, I have one quick comment. Uh, when your grandson is five years old and he turns to you and he says, I have to have some me time, then you know you've done well. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it's wonderful that she's, she's learned to listen and to hear. You know, sometimes... It, she, she she said it very glibly, and you might have passed over. But the fact that she, we tend to listen to respond instead of listening to hear, and I think that's uh, wonderful that as a mother she's sensitive to that because uh, uh, many of us aren't. Uh, and I think uh, if we spend more time listening to hear and rather than listening to respond, I think uh, we'll be better parents and grandparents. So thank you so much for sharing. Your, your maturity and your growth and development and, and then providing the counseling that uh, was so important. That, that's wonderful. We, we certainly appreciate you sharing that with us. Wait a minute, on a fun note, I started seeing a counselor too because he told me, you know what, Ms. Collin? You're politely bossy. <laughs> and I said, that is me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wow, amazing. 
Okay, if there are no more comments on that subject, uh, this is an issue that uh, is with us and has been with us for the last 50 years uh, after war. Uh, there's still post-traumatic stress disorder is alive and well and punishing the veterans. Uh, we have all kinds of substance abuse issues uh, and all kinds of mental health issues that uh, they deal with with great difficulty because they say there's a, a veteran suicide almost every hour of every day. And uh, so that uh, uh, the fact that this project offers free mental health, but many still turn it down, which is uh, uh, frightening because they need it so badly. And uh, it's so important nowadays to recognize that uh, uh, that counseling helps. Uh, and, and, and as you talk about, uh, you know, one of the things, John Robinson was our uh, psychologist and he, he pointed out that uh, uh, the easy way to treat uh, mental disease is with medication, but actually the most effective way of treating it is with psychotherapy and actually talking and listening to the patient. And uh, we see all these people who've died by suicide uh, which quadruples the number of people who lost in the war because of mental health issues, and they don't even want to accept mental health support. And so uh, this is uh, something that our loved ones who are veterans, uh, we have to be very sensitive to that. We've got to listen more to them and to uh, try to get them the help that they need. Now that the stigma for mental health is so much less, it's, uh, it was so good to hear uh, uh, Ms. Cutler talk about the fact that uh, uh, she got counseling for them. Uh, way back in the day, um, many of us felt it was a weakness to get counseling, when in point of fact, it's a great strength. So uh, just uh, any other comments about that? Because uh, this not only is true for our war veterans, but it's true for our teenagers. Hey, Dr. Callan, my, my uncle, uh, my, my father's brother, uh, he was he was in V Day. He was uh, at when they stormed the beach at Normandy. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he was there. He lived through that, and he was damaged by that severely. And he's, you know, for the rest of his life, he's been on on. He had been on. He passed away uh, five years ago. Um, uh, he had uh, therapy for that. Uh, you know. Uh, to help him, you know, deal with with the P PTSD. Uh, so I mean, it's it's a lot more than fifty years. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. That's right. Wow. Okay. Well. Okay. Um, this is mental health, as you mentioned, month and. Uh, uh, one of actually the the veterans of that war had more help than the veteran the veterans of the more recent wars, uh, and so uh, the price we pay for uh, our men going to into the war is uh, considerable. PTSD is something that is much more common than we are aware of. Now this, this is an article that uh, uh, comes from outside of the United States. And, and you wonder how valid this is. This is the first instance in which a medical device helped a man with paralysis actually walk more than a decade later after with the implantation of brain spine interfaces. And this may be the beginning of something that uh, has not happened before. People who have uh, spinal cord injuries are paralyzed for life. And to have an intervention that results in uh, them being able to walk again is unheard of. And so uh, this may be the beginning of something that uh, 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 results in more people being able to walk. Uh, so that, so this is just the first of, 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 of we hope, some uh, instances of learning how.
to overcome spinal cord injuries, which we have failed in the past. But uh, just short because uh, it's such a rare event uh, and uh, uh, it gives you a sign of hopefulness for people who uh, have had spinal injuries and are paralyzed for life. Any uh, any any comments about this? Because this is something that uh, we we don't know. We we hope this is the beginning of a new era. Time will tell. But I just thought I'd share it with you so you know about it. This is another article, I and mean, we have many articles that deal with our physical activity have some mortality risk due to flu and pneumonia. Uh, it's amazing how important aerobic physical activity is and when it's combined with weightlifting, it becomes an incredible force for health. And so this is just uh, another article that, that talks about uh, uh, how important physical activity is. And you know, you, you might say, why do we keep talking about it? Because it's so vital. That's why we keep talking about it. And so few people in the United States practice it. Less than 40% of people uh, have the uh, physical act activity that's required. And therefore, they, they have a much higher mortality rate than they should have. So we keep... Uh, bombarding you with these articles to uh, uh, to help you and you to help your your loved ones so that they will uh, uh, not only do the physical exercises but weightlifting uh, that will help them live longer. Let's go to the next one. Uh, melanoma, is, as 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 we know, is uh, occurs in blacks and whites, although it's more common in whites, but it does occur in blacks as well. And there's a cancer that if recognized early, can be uh, diagnosed and treated successfully. Uh, why is it that uh, most of the people who die of melanoma are men? Uh, well, we, we think that uh, men are less likely to use sunscreen. Uh, because we think that is a, a woman's behavior uh, without recognizing it's a skin issue, not a sex, not a gender issue. Uh, so uh, that is thought to be the number one reason why melanomas occur in men rather than women. And also when they occur, they diagnose less readily. And this suggests that uh, the higher estrogen level may be another reason. Uh, we know that men are less likely to use sunscreen, but it's uh, it's important to recognize that uh, the sun is damaging. UV light causing you need UV protective clothing. We as blacks think that it doesn't apply to us, but it does. So you women, get your men to do better when they go out in the sun. Any comments on this? I found, uh, out, I uh, found out recently how important it is to use sunscreen. Um, a week or two ago, I was at Virginia Beach just for a day or so. And I sat for a long while on a bench just sitting and talking. And then later that day, uh, I noticed a tan on my legs um, because I had a pair of pants on that was just above the knee. And it almost looks like a tattoo. It's really dark and then the normal skin. And obviously it's not going away anytime soon. <laughs> and I think had I put some sun tan lotion on and some of it is on 
my arm. I don't know if it can be seen here, yeah. but uh, but the legs look strange as though I've tattooed up to the knee and then forgot about it. But I guess at this point, it's nothing you can do. So the moral of the story is use sunscreen. And on the TV this week, they said even this time of year on a cloudy day, the UV rays are stronger. So we should use it. Forget about skin color, white, black. You should really use it. So I have a tan that I guess I'll have the rest of the summer, which is unintended, but it looks strange. So you Well, I think, thank, thank you very much for that comment, uh, yeah. Janice. Mm -hmm. as, a, uh, as a diver, I know that uh, a lot of fishermen uh, get skin cancer a lot because you not only get the direct sun, but you also get the reflected sun off the water. Mm -hmm. And also, um, to for everybody to be aware, the medicines that are in a, a lot of the uh, suntan lotions and sunblocks are damaging to the coral, okay? So, you know, we are, as divers, because we see the coral, we see the damage that these chemicals do, are recommending... Um, uh, brands of uh, sunblock that do not have those uh, those poisonous chemicals that actually destroy the coral. That's something to think about, something you might want to uh, investigate. Yeah, and then of course this ABCDE uh, guide is uh, helpful because uh, melanoma occurs in unusual locations, sometimes in the scalp sometimes in the bottom of the feet and sometimes in the fingertips so that uh, if you have any lesion that's irregular and there's a different color and and it's in changing, uh, then you should see a dermatologist. Okay, I let's go. A, I yes. have a question. Yes. Um, this is Vivian Blake. I have a transplant. I didn't know that they told me with the transplant, you have to limit your time in the sun or you shouldn't be in the sun. And I was looking at the um, suntan lotions and so forth. What do they recommend? Because they have all these ingredients in it for a uh, transplant patient. What should I use? Well, I think uh, 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 the recent attention to the uh, sunblocks that uh, have... Uh, ingredients in them that are harmful to the coral are important. But I think uh, for the most part, uh, uh, the really important thing is to keep your skin from being damaged from the sun because skin cancer is the number one cancer that affects transplant patients. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are not as sensitive to that as we should be. Uh, without question, it's the number one cancer that affects transplant pa patients. So that using uh, uh, skin uh, block uh, is uh, very important uh, for transplant patients, more so than any other patients, uh, because you're immunosuppressed and, uh, uh, and because skin cancer is uh, the most cancer and most common cancer in transplant patients. So, so uh, it's important to, to use this, the sunscreen this summer. But what type, you know, I read something by SP30 and I didn't know what I should use. Well, I, I don't know the, uh, the specific differences in the different uh, sun scans, I mean, sun okay. blocks. Uh, okay, so okay. You, you might check with your, your doctor, but I think uh, one thing is clear, you need to have a sun sunscreen. Okay, that's what I read. Thank yeah. you. And Dr. Callender, is it is not just during the summer months. Um, I know I used to like to ski during the winter months, um, snow ski. And when I first started, they said make sure you bring a sunscreen, and that just bothered me. And I said that doesn't make any sense. But um, after you're being exposed to the sun on the mountain, that re reflection can cause sun sunburn. So um, it's just not in the summer months that you need to be concerned about the sun. Okay. Thank you very much for that comment. Yes. Vivian? 
Uh huh. Yes. Oh, I, I I thought you had a comment. No. No, I'm just listening. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Calder. Yes. I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know whether it's just my observation or what, but I noticed that some people who have those diagnoses skin turn darker. Is that a result of the uh, chemo treatment and everything? Yeah, yeah. Here, here, here again, this is uh, related to the impact of the treatment on the immune system. And uh, they then uh, are more likely to have the so-called skin cancers that develop uh, because their immunity is uh, reduced. Uh, because you're talking about people who have chemotherapy, correct? Right, right. Yeah, right. And so their immune system is decreased as a consequence. And so they're more likely to develop uh, cancer of any kind and skin cancer is the commonest. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Counter, I, I looked up the the chemicals that are in the sunblocks that uh, harm, are harmful to the reef and it's uh, oxybenzone and or octi octinoxate octinoxate so oxybenzone or octinoxate are the the substances that actually kill the coral and you know we we need the coral cuz the, the the tiny fish eat the coral and then the big, medium sized fish eat the small <laughs> fish and the big fish eat the medium <laughs> fish and then we eat the big fish you know, it's really important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next article, please. Now, this is a controversial option because marijuana users uh, think that it's a great drug, which it is. It helps in, uh, for pain and many other issues. But one of the things that uh, we're to find peripheral artery disease is what PAD is uh, meaning uh, blood vessel disease in the legs and the hands and the feet. And uh, we've found uh, it didn't affect the heart, but it does affect the blood vessels. And uh, if you find people who have a uh, It's a good idea to recognize that one of the issues that can occur is that you can have small vessel disease. And people who have small vessel disease have difficulty with their feet, uh, getting ulcers, and, uh, and sometimes losing their toes and other things. And so uh, it's just a concern, those who, for your, your children and grandchildren who, who are in marijuana, it's, it's something to be aware of, just like smoking has its side effects, marijuana has its side effects as well. Dr. Counter, is uh, neuropathy uh, a, a symptom of that as well? No, but actually neuropathy is different. Peripheral artery disease is just the blood vessels. Uh, and of course, if you have blood vessel disease, you can develop neuropathy, but neuropathy is a separate entity itself, which uh, uh, is, is not so far as we know related to peripheral artery disease. Thank you. Okay, let's get to the next one where we're... Now this is the one that I thought would be interesting because we've had so many articles that demonstrate multivitamins don't help very much for many other things, but it, it does occur that uh, multivitamins may uh, help the memory. And this is something that is uh, seeing more articles that demonstrate that uh, multivitamins may help memory, whereas it doesn't help many other things. It, it does help 
it may help the memory. We're getting some early studies that are demonstrating that uh, uh, that this is multivitamins may be helpful when compared to placebo for for memory. And uh, as we age, we we like to keep our memories, and so uh, so this is one one thing that multivitamins do, do help with whether you have a deficiency or not. So anyway, food for thought. Let's go to the next one, which we might make the last one. Uh, <laughs> and then this is similar. Will it give you three years of age-related memory back? Uh, Interesting uh, thought. Uh, since uh, uh, dementia is so common in uh, older men and women. So uh, to have something that would improve your memory is an interesting thought, an interesting idea. So so for those of you who are multivitamin supplementation people, uh, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll make this the last one, okay? Uh, and these are seven surprising uh, medical discoveries, although um, I wasn't that impressed by them, but uh, uh, they were uh, made in 2023. Uh, we know that uh, there was a test, a finger, single, fingerprint test that was used to screen women for breast cancer. And uh, it was 98% accurate, which is shocking. And so this is something that may well be done uh, by a special test. And then of course, the people who got COVID and lost their sense of smell, uh, uh, maybe get it back by sniffing an orange twice a day, <laughs> which is an interesting thought that, that sniffing an orange might restore uh, your smell back. And then, of course, uh, BO being uh, an issue, uh, they suggest that people with BO, that this uh, has a calming effect. I never heard that before, but that, that was in Sweden. So I don't know if it applies to us. <laughs> and then uh, uh, one in 50 British shouldn't have a peanut allergy. Uh, but if they were interested in peanut butter early on, they would not have that uh, peanut allergy. And that's an interesting thought because uh, uh, peanut allergies can be problematic. Then uh, uh, the ability to restore movement after strokes, uh, uh, similar to the article we saw before, she had electrodes implanted in her neck and this blocked uh, the uh, uh, stroke issues and the muscles, the muscles became stronger, and actually she was able to use her her uh, her extremity again. So, so this this these these are again like any articles that are identifying ways in which the uh, impulses that come from the nerves can be engineered by by uh, using uh, special implants. And then uh, uh, we talk about uh, uh, the menopause and uh, uh, a testosterone patch is thought to restore the uh, sex drive for women. Uh, these are uh, some of the uh, interesting uh, findings of the year. And then finally, uh, uh, living in a partner might be good for you, even if it's not a good association uh, because you have a partner, at least it's better than living alone. So uh, uh, food for thought, uh, even a bad marriage can be good. So anyway, those are, yeah. are the seven uh, uh, things that were have been identified in 2023. Food for thought. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you guys for showing up. Uh, uh, since we missed last week, uh, really appreciate you coming back. We had. Uh, yeah!